Well, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, good to uh, have everyone join. Looks like we've got a pretty good audience. So uh, let's get started. Uh, I'm going to talk today a little bit about um, OS Query, the um, endpoint tool that's used to turn your operating system uh, into a SQL-like database. Uh, it runs on Windows, Linux, and Mac. Uh, and then a little bit about uh, Yara as well, the uh, Swiss Army knife for uh, pattern matching that's often used in uh, identifying malware families. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about a, uh, a couple of malwares uh, that were found in the wild and um, how the uh, traditional method of using the MD5, SHA-1 or SHA-256 uh, file hash is uh, kind of obsolete. And there are new techniques coming out for things like uh, impash and um, the JAR3 uh, signature, TLS signature, for example, um, and using Yara to uh, better detect uh, malwares and variants of malwares so that when you get a zero day, um, you have a better chance of uh, detecting it based on variants that have been uh, identified in the past. So uh, let's go ahead and dive in. So we'll start off talking about a, uh, a Connie remote access Trojan malware. This was um, identified and associated with the uh, Advanced Persistent Threat Group 37. Um, and uh, the way this malware worked is uh, it started off with a phishing document. It was a Microsoft Word document uh, that had a macro in it and some hidden text fields uh, inside of those so that when the user downloaded those uh, the file and executed the macro um, this document would go out and download the payload from the command and control server uh, then that payload would um, capture the data on the system and exfiltrate it um, so this particular variant uh, or this this malware family uh, was observed at four different timelines in 2019. And um, the malware in each case was different, uh, but there were as aspects of it that were the same and could be identified uh, with Yara. So uh, if we look here at um, some of the different variants of the malware, this was uh, DLL files on the Windows environment. We can see that the SHA-256 values of those malware files, the DLLs, were different in all cases. But the, because the same code was reused, just variations of that code, there were things that were the same about it. The impash, for example. Uh, so on the portable executable file, there's a method to try and identify uh, that file by looking at the order of the DLLs that are present and loaded. Uh, and you can see here that the impasse was the same across some variants, even though the SHA-256 was different. And um, this is important because it shows that the code reuse by the malware threat actors uh, can be detected by methods such as impasse, but also uh, Yara as well. So, so Yara is a, uh, a method that's um, looking basically at individual strings or regular expressions uh, to identify subsections within a, a file, a malware. So each rule in Yara consists of typically a set of strings uh, or regular expressions, and then the condition of how many of those strings have to match in order for the Yara rule to fire. Uh, so you can get really uh, quite specific with these Yara rules um, to identify a set of conditions that will help classify or uh, trigger on lots of different variants of the same malware if they reuse the same com code components or uh, encoding algorithms, custom base64 encoding keys and so on, you'll be able to detect those variants with the same set of Yara rules. 
So how does the Yara uh, rule work? How does, what does it look like? Here's an example uh, from the Read the Docs Yara website. You basically specify the identifying strings, whether they're ASCII strings uh, or uh, hexadecimal strings. You can put some metadata in there to describe the rule uh, and then the condition. In this particular one, it's saying uh, any one of these strings, A or B or C, uh, if any of those are found, then this rule will um, equate to true. So you can get very complex in these Yara rule specifications. Uh, you can specify uh, what the entry point is for the rule. So, you know, your string may be fairly short. And so there's the risk of getting false positives. Um, but if you specify the entry point, then you can uh, reduce those false positives by saying, uh, I must see this particular string at this particular point in the file. Uh, you can have some quite complex conditions like I see string A uh, six times and uh, string B uh, more than 10 times. And uh, you can put regular expressions as well if you don't want to specify the string, if you're finding in the malware that there's uh, a lot of variants that um, match to a particular regular expression, then you can use regexes as well inside of your uh, Yara rules. You can specify things like uh, the size of the file um, to make sure that you can exclude maybe small files that are false positives uh, and a whole host of different uh, things. So the um, Malware researchers on the case of the Connie virus were able to specify Yara rules that were able to detect the different variations uh, in all of the uh, attacks uh, in 2019. And uh, what they found was even though the DLLs that were used in each case were different, uh, as well as the, the Lua documents had differences in them, uh, by analysing those, they could set up Yara rules that could detect uh, across all of those variations. So here's an example of the Yara rule that was created to detect all the different variants of the Lua, uh, Lua document, that uh, Word document with the macro. Um, specified strings like shell, command line, environ, uh, VB hide, it was a visual basic macro. Uh, and then um, some other strings like auto open and so on. And then the condition was that it had to have four of the uh, S string and uh, one of the A string. Here's a uh, example of the Yara rule that was used to detect the, uh, the DLL, uh, the payload that was downloaded. So, um, in this case, they were looking for things like temp.zip, um, post.txt, and other calls to the DLLs, uh, all defined there in different strings, some of them ASCII strings, and in other cases, uh, hexadecimal uh, code strings. And then there's a, a condition there that says uh, which of those strings is required. So in all the different variants of the malware, this particular set of Yara rules was able to uh, fire and detect, even though the variation was significant. Here's some additional uh, resources for Yara. There's some cool tools out there like uh, Airbnb wrote a, this binary alert tool so that you can trigger Yara scans on files as they're uploaded to uh, S3, for example. Uh, there's also a, a nice tool uh, if you use CAPE, um, where you can uh, extract the payloads from malware and it'll scan those and extract the uh, different uh, IOCs, indicators of compromise, like IP address and domain associated with the command and control server. So uh, there's quite a few tools out there that you can uh, use with Yara. 
uh, and as well as the tools, there's a whole bunch of rules that you'll see out on GitHub and other sites. So uh, if you want to uh, scan using uh, existing Yara rules, uh, that's, that's quite a bit available. So you could, it's quite easy to install Yara if you want to just um, uh, test out some Yara rules against uh, some files on your system. Uh, just a matter of uh, installing it and then when you run Yara, you specify uh, the .yar file, the set of Yara rules, uh, and then the file that you want to scan or the directory that you want to scan. So here's an example where we're using rules one yar file. Uh, I think this had nine different Yara rules in them. You could have hundreds or thousands of Yara rules. But we'll see in a second that the, because we're doing some quite complex uh, comparisons in Yara, as the number of files increases that you're scanning, uh, it's going to take uh, longer to run. And as the number of um, rules as well in your rule set increases, it's going to take longer to scan. But you can go ahead and run a, a simple Yara scan uh, using a command like this. And uh, it's available on uh, all the different platforms, Mac, Windows, or Linux. So uh, if we look quickly at uh, how the uh, number of files affects the, the Yara scanning, because this is quite a, you know, significantly more complex operation than um, calculating a MD5 hash or a um, SHA-1 or a SHA-256 hash because it's it's looking at you know each of those strings in each of the files that you're looking to scan. Um, and then depending on the, the length of those strings, if it's quite a large file and you're looking for short strings, uh, you, you might get a lot of uh, hits, a lot of false positives. Or if you're using a regular expression, uh, you might, and if you have a, a very generic regular expression, then uh, it might um, take uh, a lot of time to do a scan. So here we see an example um, where we scanned uh, up to uh, 500,000 files, 600,000 files, and it took about 120 seconds. Um, now, this was only with nine Yara rules. So if you're looking using an extensive set of Yara rules, maybe it's uh, in the thousands, then uh, it can take quite a lot of resources on your machine. So here's a little little bit of an analysis of how the, the scan time varies with uh, the number of Yara rules. So um, we went up to about 250 Yara rules in this case. Um, and it took about, uh, oh, sorry, 120 uh, Yara rules took about 250 seconds on our uh, on our test set. So the uh, Yara does come with uh, some performance type metrics that are uh, given to you when you run Yara. You can see if the rules that you've created to identify the malware uh, are going to be slowing down your scanning. So here we see there's a, a warning um, that a specific string contains dot star, uh, which can um, really slow things down. Um, another, it's uh, also identifying here another string, the, the F string, it says it's slowing down your scanning. Uh, and it says this particular one is critical. So you might want to look at uh, adjusting that string and then it will tell you if it's uh, slowing down the scanning and it's not critical. Uh, and this is important because as you're using a larger set of rules and a, and a larger number of files, uh, if you don't address these uh, tuning aspects of your Yara rules, you can uh, use a lot of resources. So in our example, we looked a little bit about this at the CPU. This was a two CPU machine. So it was pretty well pegging the, the machine during the Yara scans. You can see here 197%, 193% CPU usage. Um, so when you have a large number of files and complex uh, Yara rules and a large number of Yara rules, it can really use a lot of uh, resources on your machine. So it's not really effective because of the complexity of the Yara scanning engine, particularly with 
uh, complex or large sets of rules, it's not really uh, cost effective to scan every single file on your system. So uh, we're going to look at uh, a more effective way to triage your scans and um, look at uh, how you can identify a subset of files on your systems that you can scan. So uh, OS Query is very nice for that. Uh, it provides a way to identify all of the processes that are running on your system. And also it has a, uh, the ability to do file integrity monitoring, which means look for files that change on your system. So uh, we're going to look at how we can configure OS Query so that when files change on your system, like you get a new file downloaded uh, on your user system, that you can just scan uh, that file with Yara. Or you can set it up so that uh, those processes that run on your system, potentially the, the payload or the, um, the Word document when the user opens it, um, typically that uh, set of processes that actually is running on your system is quite small. And so we can configure OS Query to uh, use Yara to scan just those files. So what is OS Query? Well, it's a nice uh, endpoint agent uh, that was originally developed by Facebook and it's now an open source tool. It's used for security, compliance and DevOps use cases. And uh, here's an example of what it does is uh, it turns the operating system into a database. So we used to have to run commands uh, like ps minus ef and then parse out the content, you know, pipe it to grep and orc and sed and so on. Now you just do a SQL statement. So here's an example of a SQL statement that's selecting some processes that are running on your machine. And then uh, you can add optional where clauses. In this particular case, they're looking for those uh, files that uh, do not have any a file anymore on disk. So, you know, one of the uh, defense and evasion uh, tactics on malware is once it executes to delete the on disk file so that it can't be uh, detected by a antivirus tool that's scanning uh, on the files. So uh, OS Query is a, um, it's a nice tool. It's fairly lightweight in terms of endpoint agents. Um, and uh, now it's open source. Um, it's I think the, the Linux Foundation owns it now and uh, runs on Mac, Windows, uh, Linux. So it's, uh, it's easy to download and it has quite a lot of uh, telemetry that's available. You can see here, this is from the osquery.io uh, website. And uh, it's got 263 tables in this version uh, of telemetry that's listed across Windows, Linux, and Mac. I think on Windows is close to 100 tables. On uh, Mac, it's close to 150. And on Linux, it's like 140, I think. But across all three operating systems, there's 260 tables worth of telemetry. So it's a really nice tool uh, if you're interested in um, getting visibility into your assets. Uh, you can look at things like the apps that are installed on Mac, the programs that are running on Windows, the registry entries, um, the startup items um, on Linux. You look at the cron entries. Uh, you can look at all of the processes that are run on your machine, uh, all of the network connections via process open sockets. And then it has a separate eventing framework, which is a pub sub framework so that uh, no data is missed. Um, because in OS Query, there's really two methods of capturing the data. One is through regular scheduled queries, and the other is through this uh, eventing framework, the PubSub framework. So you'll look, there'll be uh, tables like process events and socket events, where as every process runs or as every socket uh, is um, opened to a remote machine, like a uh, command and control server maybe, uh, that is stored in a RocksDB backing store. And then uh, when you subscribe, like if the daemon is running uh, maybe every 30 seconds or every minute or so and sending that data out to some 
uh, platform like a uh, maybe an elk stack or a splunk or something like that um, then um, the nice thing about the pub sub framework is that uh, no data uh, at all is missed so it's using on Linux the uh, kaudit framework for example so a lot of different applications um, for OS query and uh, one of those applications is uh, is Yara um, Yara comes with OS Query. You don't have to download a separate version of the Yara like I showed earlier. Uh, but OS Query also comes with uh, other tools like Augeus to uh, pull back uh, as a database rows the um, entries within configuration files like Etsy password or Etsy hosts or um, you know, if you have Apache config files or whatever it is, you can uh, pull that data back to um, return it into rows in OS Query. So there's really a lot of uh, a lot of flexibility there um, with OS Query. So <clears throat> the nice thing about this uh, pub sub framework that I talked about, uh, where it's looking at every single process that is uh, executing on your machine. Um, you can send that data out or you can use that information in conjunction with Yara. So as I mentioned earlier, you could say, let's use OS Query to determine all of the processes that are running. Um, that would be the processes table, or you could use the event-based table, which is the process events table, and then use that to trigger a scan uh, using a set of Yara rules that you have. So instead of having to scan um, 2,000, 3,000 files on your machine, you could just scan the 10 processes uh, that are running. So you can read a little bit more about uh, OS Query and its PubSub framework there on the Read the Docs website. So in addition to the, the PubSub framework, there's that file integrity monitoring feature so that OS Query can tell you if you set up the FIM config to say, um, uh, tell me when there's any changes to these files, like the user's download directory or the SSH keys on your system uh, or the Etsy uh, <coughs> binary files on your system. Uh, you can configure OS Query to say, these are important uh, directories for me and I want to know uh, when they changed. And then you can configure uh, OS Query to trigger Yara scans of those files that were detected to have changed. So OS Query, it's very easy to uh, download and install. It comes uh, on Linux, uh, CentOS Red Hat as an RPM, so you can just install it with RPM-I. And then, um, once you've got it installed, you can configure it to activate the PubSub framework so that you can start getting uh, process events recorded for every single process that runs. Um, so you have to run it with the uh, disable audit equals false. OS Query loves the, the double negatives. Uh, but you can, um, you can run it and turn on the event-based capture and start to get a record of every single uh, process that runs in the process event tables. Once you turn on that PubSub framework, you can then go into OS Query configuration and specify a set of Yara rules. So here you can see uh, this rule 60.sig file. It's a signature of um, 60 Yara rules in this case, and you specify that in your uh, OS Query configuration file, and then you can use that to do uh, scanning. So uh, here's an example where we've turned on the, um, the PubSub framework, the scanning, so we're starting to capture process events. Um, and then we can run a query like this where we can scan using Yara for every uh, process that runs on the system. So we're just saying uh, for every process that runs on our system, select distinct path from process events, go ahead and run a Yara scan, select start from Yara, uh, using a particular set of um, Yara rules, which is the SIG group one. 
and that's pointing to that um, <clears throat> Yarra rules file. And you can see the result in this case. It's it's got a hit on um, a certain file, and it's going to uh, show you the rule name. Uh, in this particular case, it was angler worm, and then it'll show you the strings that you've defined in that Yarra rule uh, that are matching. So this is a nice way to um, be very targeted in how you're scanning uh, your files uh, using OS Query and getting uh, all of the advantages of uh, the other uh, security related pieces of telemetry that you can capture using OS Query. Uh, here's how you uh, set up OS Query to when you have a file that's changed to go ahead and do a Yara scan on that file. So you set up the uh, file integrity monitoring piece. So in this particular case, you'll see that uh, we've set up file paths in OS Query to do file monitoring uh, in the user's home private directory, in the root SSH keys, uh, all of the user's SSH keys, uh, and in the Etsy directory. And once we set up those file paths, and then we also set up the Yara uh, set of rules, the signature group, which is that uh, rule 60 uh, Yara file in this case that has the Yara rules, and you then map the uh, FIM path sets, Homes and Etsy in this case, to the appropriate set of Yara rules. And once you have that set up uh, inside of OS Query, whenever you get a change uh, to one of those files, OS Query is going to report it as a FIM event, file integrity monitoring event, and it will also do a scan using Yara against that file. So you'll be able to uh, see if there's any malware based on those Yara rules that you've built. And here's what that looks like um, with FIM turned on uh, as those uh, files get uh, changed. Uh, OS Query is going to go ahead and scan them with Yara and you'll see if you get any hits. So on the very bottom right, you can see that uh, we have the uh, Evil OS X Remote Access Trojan uh, Yara rule has uh, found a match on this uh, one particular uh, launcher.b5bod8.py. So uh, the nice thing about uh, running Yara with OS Query is that the uh, the resource usage um, is particularly lightweight. Um, in this particular example, we saw that uh, we have about a 6% uh, resource usage, um, or 5%, sorry, on OS Query. Uh, this was run through the uh, OS Query I, which is the interactive version. Uh, you can also run it in a, uh, a daemon version, the OS Query D, so that it's doing these kinds of processing automatically in the in the background. Um, but this approach was really lightweight. So um, the amount of resources used because it was only uh, triggered on files that changed or on processes that ran uh, was really uh, significantly reduced. So if you were looking for a, uh, a malware and you'd maybe sandboxed a malware and got a uh, built a set of Yara rules or used a set of Yara rules that were available uh, already and you wanted to uh, check across your fleet, or all of your machines, uh, using this approach, uh, it's fairly lightweight because you're only going to be scanning those uh, directories that you've set up with FIM when the files change, or you're only going to be scanning those files that have actually executed uh, on your machines and were recorded uh, with OS Query via the process events table. So um, in conclusion, um, Yara is a, it's a really powerful tool, but it can use a lot of resources. Uh, and using OS Query is a really nice way to reduce that resource usage by using the uh, file monitoring feature as well as the PubSub framework to monitor the processes that are run. And that works really nice uh, in conjunction uh, with Yara. 
So uh, I kind of wanted to uh, open it up to questions now. If anyone had any uh, questions about OS Query uh, or about Yara, uh, feel free to uh, to fire them off. Hey, Julian. Yeah. Um, I just need to double check. Are you in um, Discord on the Track 2 channel? Uh, track 2, I am not there yet. Is that where the question's coming through? Yes. Um, okay. Uh, I haven't seen any questions just yet, but um, uh, okay. I can read them to you. If yeah, you that can. would be great. Yeah. Okay. So I do have one from Mr. Clark. Uh, have you seen any instances of malware specifically trying to detect OS query? Uh, malware trying to detect OS query. Uh, I have not uh, seen that. Um, are you thinking about it from a point of view of um, them trying to uh, detect if uh, OS query is running as a uh, kind of an anti-malware engine and so trying to thereby avoid it? Um, he has n not, he's typing right now, so we'll just give him a second. He said yes, exactly. Right. Yeah, um, I've not seen uh, any malware looking for uh, OS query specifically. Um, it's, uh, you know, because it could be looking for uh, uh, Yara as well. But uh, the fact that Yara's run from, from OS query in this case, um, that would be... Uh, kind of hard to detect because it wouldn't matter whether you're running Yara on a regular scan outside of OS query, that could be a possibility as well. Okay, I have another question from Hams. What permissions are needed to run on a network? Yeah, um, OS query um, typically runs on an endpoint itself, so uh, different from uh, you know running just on the network, but the OS query endpoint uh, you can run it uh, with regular permissions as a regular user, or you can run it as root with elevated permissions. The difference is that running regular OS query, you'll be able to get access to most of the telemetry. So for those 236 tables, uh, or 263 tables, uh, you'll be able to get I think there's about uh, 250 plus of them that are available with regular permissions, but you do need root permissions in order to uh, activate the um, the K audit framework, for example, the PubSub framework um, on Linux. Uh, so you do typically most people run the OS query daemon as root, so that they're able to uh, capture the um, the audit based events. Uh, including all of the network socket information. And that's one thing that um, can be quite uh, noisy on uh, a lot of servers is the network activity. So the OS query, when you turn it on, the, um, the amount of volume on the socket events can be quite significant. Um, and it's one, uh, it's an interesting way that uh, uh, people use OS query in a uh, malware detection scenario is um, capturing the socket events to see if the um, their endpoints are connecting to a command and control server. So they typically will have a list of IOCs based on known bad IP addresses, uh, but also domain information. So newly registered domains and lists of uh, domains from DGAs, domain generation algorithms, uh, if their machines are connecting out uh, to those domains, uh, then they'll flag it as a possible malware because uh, certain versions of OS query, like the Uptix version of OS query, can capture the uh, domains 
that are being resolved um, by your machines. Uh, and that requires the, the root permissions as well. Okay, um, I did see some people typing, but I don't see any more questions in the track too, so I'll give them a moment. Okay, yeah, while we're uh, waiting there, you know, that um, question's kind of brought up a um, some other ways that uh, people are using uh, OS query to detect malwares, and that is um, by looking at the... Uh, the client server connection uh, in the malware to the command and control server. So sometimes malwares nowadays will encrypt the traffic with their own TLS protocols. Uh, and so um, Salesforce developed a technique of fingerprinting TLS communication uh, called JAR3. And what it does is it looks at the uh, clear data in the client hello message um, and will take certain uh, key fields and um, hash those out to create a TLS fingerprint or a JAR3 fingerprint um, of the client server connection to the malware. And some versions of OS query can um, calculate that TLS fingerprint or the JAR3 fingerprint so that uh, even if the underlying code in the malware changes significantly, uh, you'll still have the same TLS fingerprint uh, for that malware as it's communicating with the command and control server. So there's lots of nice ways that uh, OS query can be used, uh, not just with Yara, um, but a lot of stuff are around the networking side uh, as well. Okay, I don't see any more questions. Um, Julian, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, Please don't leave the the go to webinar. I'll go ahead and switch you out. Oh, actually, it looks like oh, Mr. Clark said um, awesome presentation, and also thank you for your presentation. So great. Well, thanks everyone for joining. Appreciate it.